Hey man, we are back for another episode of the Music Retail Show. Man, of course, we're we are still reaching out through uh, internet means and having a great conversation today with a huge friend of ours and and of mine as well. This is Kevin Johnson of Music Go Around uh, in Columbus uh, and other locations. We'll dive into that. But man, Kevin, great to have you on here, man. Uh, I always love talking to you. Thanks. Yeah, it's good to be here. We end up in long calls. <laughs> yes, long calls, long calls. Always, you know, always referencing um, older TV shows a lot of times. Correct. <laughs> and Porsches. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and certain people who used to drive them. <laughs> so, Kevin, man, how's it going? It's going good. So we're um, we're feeling the love. We're coming back. People are starting to come back in. Okay. Um, Ohio lifted all the bands yesterday. Yesterday. So yeah. Okay. Well, Ohio lifted them last week, but Columbus lifted them. Franklin uh, or uh, Franklin yesterday. County. Yeah. Okay. City City Council said, "Okay, we'll go with what the state said." Okay. Okay, so. that's cool. Now, have have you seen a big change? with those announcements or were people already still trying to come in before that? Cause they were, they were over it. People were coming in already, Yeah, but uh, now they're coming in without masks. Oh, so, okay. and, uh, and before it was really weird. So in the beginning people would come in without a mask and we'd ask them and then get angry mm-hmm. and leave. Yeah. Oh, and really? we even had a mask to give them. Yeah. And then when everything kind of hit the fan for the big time in June and they're like, it's airborne and that's how you catch it there was no longer a problem with saying, please wear a mask. Yeah. People were like, that sounds great. I'll do that. Yes. And then now, now we're getting, we're back to where it's airborne, but we seem, if you get a vaccine, you might get it, but it'll be a cold. It won't be, Yeah, you're going to be on a respirator. So it's they're coming off. Well, and you know, I think people are, I think people have decided that, um, uh, you know, they have to play their part. You know, I think uh, there's, there's a right. lot of people that, you know, wanted to be very cautious. And, you know, now that, you know, the vaccines have been rolling out and people have been getting them, I think I think people are just they're ready to get back to the way things way things were. Now, I will say this. The music industry isn't the same as it was before. No, so people have money to burn and the customers have money in their pockets <laughs> and they're looking for somebody to give it to. And we're trying to do that. Uh, yeah. You're helping. You're like, you can, you can exchange that over here all day long, but um, yeah. Yeah. So, and I'll, I'd love to dive into that in a little bit, you know, just how it was, but, but uh, Kevin, I do want to real, uh, you know, recognize, man, we're having this conversation because a lot of times we want to throughout the year, we want to go through and highlight people that we've had the pleasure of doing business with here at MIRC um, uh, over the years. So how many years have you been doing business with MIRC? Probably 23 or 24. 24. So about 97, 98, 97, 98. I opened in 96. Did you? So, I, and I think it, MIRC became a reality right around the same time. Okay. But we weren't the first customers of in the door yeah no and in fact actually there was another music ground that he it was um greensboro music around the old owner do you remember him yeah um yeah all of a sudden his name's dave 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 yep. something he he every time i talked to him on the phone he'd always be like i was one of i was one of the first customers you guys ever had like he'd he'd say that but did it come time. out like i was one of the first customers <laughs> yeah he, he kind of had a gravelly had a, uh, had a gruff voice you don't want to mess with me yeah. voice. yeah so <laughs> and i'm just like okay i believe you dave I, i'm sure you were but you know nobody's around to prove that so correct but um <laughs> anyway so man 23 24 years that's impressive so uh uh, man, yeah. I know we appreciate that uh, on our side immensely, and um, I feel like we've grown and and done a lot together. And of course, that's why we want to have this conversation today, is to talk about some of the strategies and things that you've incorporated through our relationship. So, uh, but man, tell me a little bit about yourself. You started buying 23, 24 years ago. You opened up in about 96. How did you even get involved with the Music Around uh, franchise? I became unemployed in the grocery industry. Oh, okay. And uh, then I was trying to decide, do I want to uh, get a, try to get another job in that industry, which I loved, or um, start my own business? And the local newspaper had a business opportunity section in it. Okay. It's a thing that's made out of paper. You know, people yeah. sometimes. What's the newspaper? Those. I don't know. Dispatch? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so it said, uh, own your own music store, open a music go-round store. 
same people that did play it against sports and once upon a child. And yeah. those two were thriving in Columbus. The founders of once upon a child were here and the number one played against sports was in Columbus, Ohio, of course, across the country. Yeah. So I went and interviewed the owners of those things and said, tell me, what do you think about the parent company? What do you think about the concept of re resale and that kind of stuff? And, um, I, I secret shopped the other music stores in town and they were not nice to me at all. <laughs> I mean, I wore dockers and penny loafers and a leather jacket. So I didn't look like a poor musician. I looked like a guy with room on his credit card. Sure. And I would get accosted like, didn't you read the sign? Don't touch guitars without help or whatever. I'm like, holy crap, man. Uh, but there's a percussion store in town, Columbus Pro Percussion. They were awesome. And I didn't know I was in there. I'm an idiot. I didn't know what to ask about drums, but the guy was perfect. I'm like, all right. So if I don't focus on drums, I focus on guitars and I'm nice to people. I should be able to make a living. And if the secondhand concept takes off, I should be able to do really well. Yeah. Um, but it was just, it was really, man, if I'm just nice to people, I mean, in the grocery industry, you're, it's, it's a, you're shopping with your neighbor, you know, mm -hmm. and the cashier lives down the street and the store managers coaches, your kid's softball team. Yeah. I mean, that's what the grocery industry is about. Yeah. But music stores were kind of a, uh, cl almost a closed group. If you were a musician and you knew a musician that worked there, you got to buy new stuff at cost plus 15. If you didn't know anybody, you paid over list because there was nowhere to find what list was in 96. You couldn't log on and say, Oh, what's a Sweetwater selling Fender Mexican basis for, you know, it it's almost, exist. it's almost hard to believe at this point in time, the internet's been right. around so involved in our lives. It's almost hard to believe that you couldn't look things up. Back right. Then. Yeah. <clears throat> so, which probably helped a lot of the used market. I'm sure the margins back there in the used in the used market were uh, more than excellent. Ours were a little better, not not that much better, because the challenge was um, in the beginning just getting people to sell to us in the first place. Yeah. Okay. You know, this That's thought bad. was sell. You know, the other music stores, all their yellow page ads said we buy, but if you called them up and tried to sell them something. Mm -hmm. Unless it was a four thousand dollar less Paul and you didn't know what you have, yeah, they didn't want to buy it from you. Yeah. And we were buying the day-to-day -day beater stuff, the clarinets and trumpets and stomp boxes, and I mean we would buy everything. Um, my big break came, I think, in ninety-eight when a, a two-store chain closed and got uh, the bank took it over. Yeah. And I managed to get to buy it from the bank at pennies on the dollar. The bank loaned me the money to buy it. And so I took out a hundred twenty thousand dollar loan on top of what I already owed, and filled four storage units, my garage, my kitchen, and a bedroom in my apartment Are you with kidding? stuff. No, wow. and it was new stuff. Hey, uh, and I want to guess. Us, I want to guess what the what the stores were in Columbus. Was was it was oh, it, it was um was it Coil Music? No, okay, no, they closed a little later. It was okay. uh, Marion Music. And Marian. they had Ohio Pro on Morse Road. Oh, okay. Marion was huge. Annie had a recording studio. Okay. And so um, I got all that stuff, and we were selling it at new prices. I'm sorry, new stuff at used prices yeah. in a 2,800 square foot store. And we were just we were pumping it out. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the first day I signed the paperwork on a Thursday on a Friday, and my number one employee and I all I had was a pickup truck with a cap, and I go, dude. I just bought a music store <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> Let's go get it. And so we drove up to Marion and filled the back of my truck and we walk in the front door with the banker and Sean's like, my guy, he's like, so what did you get? And I said, this room, that room, two rooms in the back, a room upstairs. And there's a recording studio around the corner. And he literally started jumping up. And <laughs> did he really? That's cool. <laughs> he was like, he looked at me like I was joking and I was just flatlined. I'm, I was in kind of shock, you know? So like for the next month, my dad and I, I rented U-Hauls, mm -hmm. old stick shift Chevy with a big steering wheel. Yeah. And we drove up to Marion, loaded it, came back and rented more and more storage units. And um, then we just pumped it into the store and cycled through it. It took about two years to sell through everything. But uh, but I paid the loan off early yeah. so I could sleep at night. Yeah. And, but that's that put us on the radar. Because everybody, word got out among everybody, musicians, dude, you know you can get a new EQ graphic equalizer and music around for 30% less than you pay new at Coil or whoever, yeah. you know? Yeah. So that really, I think, that put us on the radar and that helped us grow. And then once you have the gear, 
it's a continuous feeding, you know, people trade in and then you got more stuff to sell to the next person. Yeah. So you really want to work the trade, yeah. but you got to have the stuff in the four walls first to get them in the door. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and of course this is, this is exactly what I want to talk to you about here in a little bit, but, but, um, the, the leverage of buying and, you know, buying opportunities. So, um, yeah, big deal. So, but since then, so you started that, that, that store was in, was in Columbus over by, uh, Bethel, Bethel road. On Bethel, right off 315. Right off of 315, just North of, uh, kind of, well, North, a little bit north OSU. of the high state campus. Yeah. Or yep. was it on? Yeah. So no. <clears throat> that was the first one. And then you expanded to uh, Gehanna a little bit later on or. Right. In 2000, um, <laughs> the parent company started advertising for a second franchisee in town. <laughs> You're like, Oh and, no. <laughs> yes. And I didn't want to have, I didn't want to have um, somebody bidding against me on stuff. Yeah. Cause it was pretty, the other music stores didn't want to buy you stuff. So it was pretty awesome. We were the ones. And then, so I decided either I open it and then I can work, have the teams doing the same strategies and I won't have people going back and forth trying to get the best deal. Mm-hmm. Or I could see what happened if somebody else opened one and what if we didn't get along and then we're like in a bidding war on everything. Yeah. So I opened the second one and then, and it worked out. It, it uh, took a couple of years, but it got going. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. And then and it didn't take away from the first store. The guys at the first store were really angry. They're like, you're going to take all the good gear out of here and take it out there to make that one work. And yeah. I never did. I told them up front, I said, that's not going to happen yeah. because that's not how I'm going to run it. It's going to be self-supporting mm-hmm. or it's not going to be there in five years. Yeah, There's a lot of people in between Bethel Road where you are in Gehanna. There's a lot of people. There's a Correct. lot of business and a lot of instruments to buy. So, right. um, yeah, no, Columbus is a, Columbus is a great area. It's got a really good music scene. There's a lot going on, st- especially in the short North and, and, you know, and just even surrounding, um, actually a good buddy of mine, uh, Dave, you know, Dave Clow, uh, three sided, so, yeah. three sided poster. Okay. Uh, Dave yeah. Clow. I mean, he lives down here, but he goes up and plays up in Columbus all the time. So, yeah. uh, on a consistent basis. So, but, um, and Delane Christian who's a regular customer of mine, customer yeah. of mine. And he's a monster. He buys 13s for oh, his guitars. Really? He's a man and a half. Yeah. And he plays everything. He plays in Franklin all the time. He does he really? There. Oh, okay. He comes up to Columbus once a month and does a weekend of gigs. Uh-huh. And he goes back down and he plays all over where you guys are. Well, my goodness, man. Yeah. Well, that's a good reason for you to come down here and visit us. You can go see him. So there you go. But, um, yeah, so, so that's good. So you obviously, we, you went from the one store, expanded the second store. And then obviously right. within the last five, six, six years or so, you actually acquired Ann Arbor. Correct. Uh, the guy up there had opened six months after I opened my first store and he was ready to retire and we got to talking and, uh, we ended up working out a deal where he and my son, his son and I were going to buy the store from him. Yeah. That partnership didn't end up working out. So now I've got a store three hours away, but it's a good city. It's a night. I mean, you got to be careful when you say that in Columbus. I know, man. Ann Arbor, and Columbus, there's a little bit but, uh, of a, there's a little bit of a rub there. So yeah, but the people up there don't care. It's all the people in Columbus <laughs> that, are, that have a chip on their shoulder. The guys in Ann Arbor don't care. Uh, it's a nice clean town. It's, it's like, uh, it's really, I was shocked. Yeah. I mean, I went up there the first time and he, Mike gave me the exit to get off and I get off and it says U of M stadium, right. And his store was like a quarter mile to the left. I'm like, dude, you didn't tell me you were close to the university. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> Everything uh, he just like flat lines. Yeah. Well, and, it's a great, I mean, it's a great area. I mean, anytime you can be in a near a college town, anything like that, you're going to obviously um, uh, get a lot of activity. Right. And there's a pretty active music scene. Okay. You got college. Yeah. So, it, you know, over this time and you've now you've had uh, three locations. Um, at what point in time did you in the history of your experience, did you start adopting online selling? When did you feel like you needed to? Well, I did it early. Um, I actually had um, I have rental properties and one of my tenants was an Internet developer. OK. And so he, he made me a little website back when you had dial up modems. And he had a bass drum in the corner that kicked. You've got, and we would just we we just had information on there that we would post two or three things that you would have to come in to buy. Yeah. So that was our first leap into it. And then when the music around group started doing a website, since I already had one, 
I didn't have to pay the fee to get theirs because they wanted me on theirs. Yeah. My, mine was, I mean, this is 1999. So there was like, there was no put your credit card number in and make a purchase and get it shipped. But I wanted to be on there. So the people that did use the internet yeah. could see there was a store in town that bought you stuff. Gotcha. But yeah, I followed whenever music around went online with the big picture and pictures and all that stuff. That's when we went. Did you jump on the eBay train pretty quickly or did that uh, take a little bit of time? I, I don't do a lot on eBay. Okay. I don't do a lot on Reverb. We use that for, if we had something in our store that was, so let's say I've got a 1960 Selmer Mark VI alto saxophone. That's pretty desirable. It's a desirable year. It's a desirable sax. It could be beat to hell, mm -hmm. but sax players want it because mm -hmm. it plays and sounds good. And we didn't have a customer in Columbus that would buy it if we would put it on reverb or well, put it on eBay first and then later reverb, it would get the right eyes on it. And we would end up selling it for sometimes a little more than we had it in our store because mm -hmm. we would, we would mark it up for the, for reverbs to cover our costs and it would sell like that. So we use it for special things mm -hmm. um, that don't, that if we give them enough time in the store, they don't sell. Like right now we actually have a 68 Fender, um, the predecessor to the Telecaster, I can't remember. Broadcaster? Broadcaster. Yeah. I think so. Or no so we'll pick up Telly, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we've got one of those. We've had it for about two and a half months. So okay. we'll probably put that on reverb and get, get our price out of it. Now, is this more of a strategy coming from you, or is this more of a music go around as a, as a, as a company strategy? It's our strategy okay. for my stores. Yeah. Um, some of the music go arounds put a lot of their inventory on reverb. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many are doing eBay anymore because reverb is so music centric Yeah, that it's a better venue. Yeah. It's interesting to see that shift. I mean, it was all about right. eBay and driving the traffic and reverb has kind of, kind of taken that because it's yeah. so music centric that people, you know, go, Hey, this just kind of makes sense. Right. So the traffic is still there on eBay, but, but reverb is definitely get, definitely like you're saying, has that vibe um, that if you want to reach the, you know, the musician. So I think guitar stuff is reverb, especially. Yeah. I think you still might find that band and orchestral stuff. You might do better on eBay. It's, it's changing. It's dynamic, but mm -hmm. yeah. yeah but, so, guitars. but the strategy for music ground has always been to drive that traffic into the store. That's, right. that's always been the, the, the thing that you guys, there are supplier. Yeah, that's right. Next to MIRC. <laughs> that's right cue the commercial but uh yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, that's right well and that it just makes sense i mean you need to try to get people in i mean and reverb and ebay which is great as tools as they are are a reason for people to not come in your store so i can understand why you would want to make sure you stay on this side of your strategy to keep the, the flow of inventory coming through having said that the dynamic now is to try to find the balance of um, selling online through our store's website, mm -hmm. um, but also realizing and acknowledging, and I was slow to grasp this concept, but 70% of our web traffic is local people just looking to see what came in yesterday. Is it really? Yeah. That, that's and like I argued that. I stood at a the conference and, and called bullshit, and, they, and everybody looked at me, and, <laughs> and then, you know, corporate's like, well, the fact is that 95% yeah. of online sales start at Google Shopping, and 70% of your local traffic is from people in Columbus. If you want proof, we'll give it to you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, okay, I'll listen now. Man, that's actually yeah. very interesting because, uh, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better scenario. Right. So the guy, so, and I thought, and then I got to thinking about it and how many times do we take the phone call at three in the afternoon? Hey, do you still have that boss DS1 made in Japan pedal? Yep. I'll be in at 530 when I get off work. And it's like, ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's the person that they're telling me is actually there. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. 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 Absolutely. But, um, um, I don't know. So, uh, it, yeah, I get it. You know, the, the online aspect of everything is, is it is a fine balance. And that's been a lot of conversations that we've had with a lot of guests on this show and dealers as we're working with people is to try to, um, find that, find that balance. And I think in the last year, as COVID was going on in 2020 and 2021, you know, a lot of people had to gravitate to selling online to move stuff because traffic was gone. Did you guys kind of go that way as well? 
we ran a skeleton crew and sold what was inside the four walls at all four store at all three stores. But yeah. then, you know, come September, we were out of inventory because people were reluctantly coming out, but they weren't coming out to sell stuff. They were coming out to buy. Yeah. And we're by grocery stores. And so we're by the, the man, the necess, the necess, necessities. Mm -hmm. So they go to the grocery store to get food and milk and that kind of stuff. And they'd stop at our store on the way home and get strings or to, maybe to look at stuff. So we ran into a drought of incoming gear. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's, I mean, I've been buying from you guys to fill gaps for 24 years. Yeah. But last fall, I was, I'm pretty sure I was on the phone to you every, every week. Like, yeah. Dude, dude, what do you got? <laughs> yeah. We'll buy, we'll buy whatever you have. And that yeah. actually is, um, part of, you know, obviously why I wanted to have this conversation today. And it's the highlight is, is I feel like that has always been a strength of yours that I've noticed is, is that, um, um, you have all kinds of dealers and let me just paint a quick picture. You know, you have some dealers, a lot of times we have new dealers that call in or even, uh, you know, people that have been around for years and they go, Hey, listen, I've got a niche. I only buy this because I only sell this. And now I, I know my customer and great. I get that people do that, but you know, but I think that, um, when people talk that way, they've immediately kind of backed themselves into a corner of what the potential of what they can do. I've never, ever, ever felt that, uh, from you. I've, in fact, I've experienced the complete opposite that what you, what we've said around here is that you buy opportunities. If there's an opportunity, you buy it and you create something out of that to be able to sell something to the people walking into your music stores. Well, the benefit I'm benefiting from having foot traffic now. Mm -hmm. Now that we're established, I can bank on, I'm going to have people coming in, mm -hmm. but I've always wanted to do that. I used to call, I mean, 15 years ago, I remember calling saying, what have you got weird? Mm -hmm. And my yeah. rep's like, we've got these uh, Airstream trailer Epiphone guitars oh, that are goodness. really heavy yeah. and clumsy. Great. I'll take a couple. Yeah. And I, what else you got? I got these weird guitars with, with uh, rivets and knobs on the front and a gauge. Take a couple of those. Yeah. And they color the wall, mm -hmm. you know, they make it different. If people come in and see different stuff, it, they don't, I mean, uh, the historical music stores didn't understand turn. I, I think that was another thing I brought from the grocery industry. You know, you got to turn that stuff, mm -hmm. your milk, your cheese, it's only got a certain shelf life. Your bread's got a shorter shelf life, your canned goods. They have a shelf life, whether you want to read the label or not. Yeah. Um, the grocery store has got to turn that stuff. Well, I see my inventory the same way. Um, I've got to turn in a certain amount of time. It's a different, it's a different formula, if you will, than grocery stores, but I don't want to be sitting on stuff for a year. So, yeah. and honestly, the, 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 uh, trailer trash, I don't know what they were called. That's what I called them. Yeah. The, 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 the Airstreamers or the air. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We totally couldn't sell it. Those. So we raffled it off. We had a contest in store and you sign up and you get the guitar. Yeah. So but that's still, what I'm saying. I turned it into a win. That's exactly right. And that's what I'm talking about is you, 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 it's an opportunity. It's not necessarily always, um, the best thing, but what you're doing is, is you're taking what you can get and you're creating an opportunity at it. But two things that I felt like you, that I'd love to hear more from you on is, 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 is the idea of buying consistently and how do you incorporate your GM ROI, you know, your, your, your return on your investment. I mean, um, a lot of people want to jump right to the conversation of margin. You know, but there's there's different aspects of how you can approach pr approach margin, and you know, there people might go, well, I can't buy that because the 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 margin that I want is not there. But then you know, but as you said, turning things, moving inventory creates margin in itself because you're flipping those dollars again and again and again. So right. talk about buying consistently and how you incorporate that into your return on investment. Well. You know, I don't have a strict must have margin mm -hmm. because it, if I sell something at a, so 30% isn't great, but if I sell something at a 30% margin in six weeks, I've got that money back plus what I made to reinvest and turn it into more money. Yeah. If I hold out to make a 48% margin, I may or may not get that, but it'll take me four or five months. Yeah. I'd rather sell it at the 30, 35% margin, turn it and buy something else. And 
it's served me well operating that way. I mean, I understand the folks that do it the other way, but that again, that gets us back to when we put things on reverb, mm -hmm. we have it in our store. We think we have a good price on it. If it doesn't sell in four or five months, we just don't have the right eyes on it. We don't have the right traffic. Yeah. So let's put it where we can get the eyes on it because we're getting to the point now where we're pretty good at buying. We don't make that many mistakes. We make low mistakes and the customers grab those up quick, but <laughs> we don't very often make the high mistakes and yeah. overpriced stuff. So um, I should knock on wood so yeah. I don't drop three grand on a fake Gibson. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's the, that's the way I, my plan. It's sort of like volume versus, uh, you know, you can turn that dollar four times or you can turn it two times. Well, I'd rather go for the turn it four times at a lower profit, but the bottom line in the end is more profit. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's a, that's a, and we had a great episode uh, last year on GMROI and, yeah, uh, and I like that. yeah, and it was a great episode because it, it does, you know, it is a formula and it is something that you have to put effort into, to understand and to be able to incorporate in your business practice. And, um, mm -hmm. When my experience was a lot of people didn't, don't think that way. You know, they think, well, if I buy something, I, I need to make this certain amount of margin um, or else I'm just not going to buy it. And I feel like that is one of the, the number one way to leave money on the table. So if you can buy something and flip it in, in, in six days and make 30 points on it, would you not do it over and over and over again? Because how many times would those dollars be turned into within a month to two month period of time? Right. But also keeping in mind, you still, I, I'm thinking blended. Okay. Yeah. So there's a number of things I buy from you that I'll make 40, 45 points on, but there's also ones I'll make 30 points on. Like we were talking the other day for my order and uh, you said, you want some X guitars? I'm like, yeah. Have you he heard or seen anything about them before? No. I just need guitars. <laughs> and you're like, what? I, go, I don't know. Was it Woodson or something? Oh, Woodsong. What yeah, song? Okay. what song? They're the, yeah, the what the acoustic line from Gold Tone, and yeah, you I'm know, like, but we, you you needed lefties, and we had those Correct. lefties, and they're nice guitars, and I just you know, yeah, ex perfect example. Sure. Right. So you know, I need I need inventory. Mm -hmm. I can't turn. I can't make any money if I don't sell it in the first place. Man. So. Th that's that's the yeah yeah um a, a thirty percent margins better than zero percent margin all day long. But I couldn't keep the store open on just 30. Sure, absolutely. I mean, there's, so that's where it comes yeah. into. Yeah, and, and that's, but that's where the concept of where you're saying is, is not only do you have to buy consistently, you have to turn consistently as well. So, Correct. Um, what are yep. some things that you guys do in your store to turn consistently? Well, what we used to do is we had a, um, we called it a tired of looking at it sale. Okay. So I was tired of looking at it on the wall. <laughs> So we would go through, and if it was three months old, we would three to four, three to five months, we would mark everything down uh, 15 or 20 percent and have the price end in 0.98 instead of 0.99. Okay. So, and we would send out an email blast or a or postcard and say, hey, we're having our tired of looking at it sale. Starts Friday. We'd start markdowns on Wednesday. And by we had smart customers would come in Thursday because it was half marked down mm -hmm. and they'd get the early pickings. But uh, now we've changed our strategy to every week we print off a list of what's hit the 90 day mark. Okay. And we mark it down and we change the price to ending in 0.98. So the customer in the store can see it. It triggers it on our website so that if you, I, I think it says clearance items or um, there's some box you can click on our website to sort by things that have been marked down. And as if it ends in anything other than 0.99, it feeds. Okay. And so if something gets, so if it makes it to, so the first markdown is 90 days, second markdown, I think is 120. So when it gets to 120, we mark it down and it ends in 0.97. Okay. So then again, it's, and it's a cue to my employees too. So a customer's in here, you know, dickering on a, on a keyboard, you know, a Yamaha PSR, whatever it is. And they're like, yeah, you've got 179.78 on this. Uh, what's your best price? I'm like, well, they're 259 new and we've already marked it down once. I think we're in pretty good shape. Yeah. So, and if it's still here in another month, it'll get marked down again. Okay. But 
it's up to you. Do you think it'll make it another month or you think somebody's going to buy it at that price? Because <laughs> they're saving 70 bucks. That's right. Know? Yeah. So, the fear of missing out is a great selling tool. Correct. You yeah. have to, you don't want to be too uh, in their face about it, but yeah. That's we right. do say you snooze, you lose. You snooze, which, you lose. We and did, from somebody, I don't know who. But did you did you also uh, did you say just a second ago that you actually put those markdowns on a specific time of the week? Did you say that? I, I, I thought, oh, we used to. You used to. Now we print. The, we try to print the list on Monday and Tuesday so that the everything will be marked down by Friday. So. Okay. Looking at standard weekend in retail, we're going to have more people that are yeah. free to come in and shop. Well, and I didn't know if that was a good strategy to try to train people to know that, hey, oh, I know that this music around is going to probably mark some stuff down on this specific time. And it just is a, a, you know, a natural reaction to get people to drive traffic to you. Because the staffing levels and the inconsistency of people coming in and out and buying, we can't nail it down that tight. So we print it on Monday and Tuesday, and our goal is to have it done by Friday. Mm -hmm. Usually it gets done sometimes if there's enough, if there's too many customers in the store. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I try not to run overstaffed. We may not get to the whole list, but we do our best. Yeah. So, but people don't, can't really, but our customers do ask, well, how long have you had this? And so if the guys, sometimes the guys will say, <laughs> oh, wow. They'll look at the tag. Okay. This has been three and a half months and we haven't marked it down yet. And they'll go check the list and it may be on the list waiting to get marked down. Okay. And so we'll say, well, actually the price is $37 less. That's what it is if you want it. But I tell the guys, print the label with the lower price, put it on there so that the customer knows if they don't buy it, the guy behind them is going to see the same lower price. Yes. So... Man, that's pretty, that's actually, yeah, I mean, it's pretty smart. And I guess that's where you really get down into the trenches. Uh, Creates urgency. Yeah, on their part. you're really uh, on a personal level. You've got to deal with a lot of people. Do you, I mean, do most people, is the attitude um, that people walking into your store that they're always looking for a deal? Or do you have a whole slew of people that are always coming to you just to buy stuff because you have what they want? I think it's both. Okay. I think we've got a reputation. Like a lot of people um, will call us. Like if uh, if a guy needs two SM58s for his gig, mm -hmm. they'll call us and see if we have used ones because they know they're 30 bucks less than they are new. Okay. Or, you know, and then I'll say, uh, you know, I don't have any right now. Thanks for calling us first. Yeah. Because they're basically going to go to another store and get it new. We sell, we sell them new now too, but but they call us first to see if they can get it for less money. Yeah. You know, the bread, that's kind of a bread and butter thing. SM57, SM58, that's the go-to live mic. Um, but I, I appreciate that they call us first just to see if we have it. No, I mean, um, that's, yeah, it just sounds like, that absolutely sounds like they trust you. So, right. which is, which is what you want, which is, which I th still think thinking back to earlier, what you said about how, you know, Google shopping and Google searches that a lot of uh, that online traffic is from local people just finding out what you have. I'm still, I'm still fixated on that, that aspect. I think that's huge. I thought it was, I thought it was unrealistic. I, yeah. I mean, I really called them out and they called me out. <laughs> so <laughs> they were right. That's right. So in, oh, but over the last several months, we've seen how supply chains across the United States have, have changed everything. You know, you've got brand new manufacturers that they're trying their hardest to get guitars and, and, and music gear into, into different stores. Have you felt, um, have you felt, this this struggle that's been going on i realized last year uh you felt because nobody was walking and selling stuff but um, um the supply chains have been crazy i mean what have you seen yeah. that's been going on the last five or six months uh, well copper you can't get copper so i mean we're it's copper and steel so the string manufacturers the cable manufacturers i'm trying to order six weeks out yeah so my quantities are ridiculous and I'm telling them up front, ship what you have on the floor now yeah. and filter the rest to me, if you will, please. So I have stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I'm actually, I'm finding secondary suppliers for those things so I can have backups. So I've got, so I don't run out of 10 foot guitar cables and 20 foot mic cables and the, the basics. Um, I'm finally getting a handle on that. I was a little slow to get, get my head around it, but yeah. now I'm understanding it and, and, and playing by the rules and it seems to be working out. It's costing a little bit more up front. You know, you, you plan your cash flow with turns, but at this point, I, I can't plan my, I am 
pretty confident I'm going to sell it if I can get it in the door or in the back door. Yeah. So I just got to try to get it. Are you still selling at the rate? Like, I mean, like you're stockpiling, getting as much as you can in, but you're the, it's still being sold in your store as just as fast. Yeah. I think our turns on the, on the, um, on the accessories, if you will, Mm -hmm. are higher right now. Are they really? Because everyone's out of it. Yeah. That's just, uh, um, there's just not as much available anywhere. So whatever you can get, you can get, I mean, I'm ordering new guitar pedals that I I'm going two or three deep on them because we'll, they'll sell now and we couldn't sell them before. Yeah. I mean, we, we sold them, but sure. they were trade bait. Yeah. Okay. Now it's actually, Oh, you actually have it in stock. Mm-hmm. Cool. I'll be over and there. We'll sell it. Yeah. So, so now also the thing that I'm seeing over the last several months is as supply chains have been the way they are, um, that, um, you know, before when you have a lot of inventory and fewer buyers, people are willing to do deals. I feel like a lot of people are slipping the other direction and going, Hey man, what's the deal on that? And you're like, the price is the price because you can't get, can't get it anywhere else. Or there's very few options out there on a lot of different instruments. Are you kind of seeing this too? You're holding your ground on your pricing. Well, we already did that. Yeah. We were, we were pretty firm on that. You're ahead of the curve. Yeah. Well, (laughs) that's one way to put it. I had, I can't tell you how many old men lectured me my first year or two in business. You're being penny smart and dollar stupid there, buddy. I'm like, (laughs) okay, come back in a month and see if that guitar you want me to drop a hundred bucks off of is still here. And you know, and what's awesome is this is crazy. So we had, an early 70s Gibson Walnut 335. Mm. Not crazy collectible, but kind of unusual, right? Yeah. All walnut. Mm-hmm. So we had one in. We sold it for 1350 and this guy was complaining, yeah, you know, you're not going to sell that. You should sell it for less. So crazy thing is, it sold, and another one walked in, and we put it at the same price, and the guy's like, so you about ready to drop the price on that Walnut 30, 335? Mm. And my guy's like, that's the second one. We already sold the last one at that price. So no, we're not going to drop the price. Yeah, yeah seriously. And, you know, I'm just trying not to jump up and down and scream in excitement, you know? Yeah. And <laughs> but, what are uh, the chances that a second one of that exact same guitar would walk into your store? Right. But like, it, it did. Yeah. But, but as far as a black Squire Strat and a 15 watt Fender guitar amp or Marshall guitar amp, you know, that stuff does come and go fast. Yeah. And we've gotten to where we set a fair price. And and we also try to pay the person that's selling us a fair price. Yeah. I mean, we one of the things that I had to overcome when I first opened is that the music stores that did buy stuff kind of operate like pawn shops did. And they mm-hmm. would like, oh, ball you. Yeah. We'll give you 30 bucks for it. What are you going to sell it for? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then they come back with 150. Well, we we from the very beginning said, I can sell this for 75 bucks. I can give you 30 bucks in cash or 40 bucks in trade in if you spend the whole trade in my store. Yeah. And we would write it down and hit show them this is the number. This is where it's at and eventually people began to trust us because we didn't raise prices. Mm-hmm. We would come pe- people come back and find their thing and say, "So what'd you raise the price on this to?" Oh, wait, that's the same thing you told me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely being on. So uh, I'm interested what is the what wh- what's the ratio of business that you do where people just come in and pay cash or people come in and trade? Um, I don't know that. <laughs> well, and I'm just, I'm just, I, I is it, yeah. is, is it in the 50, 50 range or is no, it? No, I know? think we sell, I, I think trades probably only represent, I would speculate 15 to 20%. Oh, okay. That's- but anytime I get a phone, when I answer the phone and someone wants to bring in something yeah. because Due to COVID, we've been scheduling appointments. It okay. makes people more comfortable. They're in the store less time. Sometimes they'll even drop it, go out in their car, and we call them on. In, but um, I'll say, what else have you got? Well, what do you mean? I said, we buy stands. We buy old stomp box. We buy the drum hardware you're back in your band left at your basement. Mm-hmm. I mean, we buy all that stuff. Yeah. You know, and they're like, oh, well, you know, I do have this practice amp that I haven't used in a long time. That's my bread and butter. Go get it. <laughs> you know? That's right. So, go grab it. I, when I, and I, one of my favorite things is when I first started, I got a wrong number at the store mm-hmm. and, and the ladies and the lady was friendly. So I said, you don't have any instruments you want to sell, do you? And she's like, what do you mean? <laughs> she had a French horn. Really? I didn't have any French horns in the store. She brought in a French horn and sold it to us. My goodness. So, so we ended up with a French horn that we wouldn't have had, had I not just said, 
other than her saying wrong number, if I hadn't said, well, since you're on the phone, you know, what do you got that you're not playing? You know? Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, I'm not really a musician, but I used to play French horn. Yeah. You want it? Oh yeah. Yeah. And she won cause she got some cash yeah. that she didn't know she had. Yeah. You know, man. And I just, and I realize it too, that the, uh, over the last year, it's just kind of like, you know, with the supply is unpredictable. Um, it, it, you know, and it feels like, and I get it. Your whole idea is, is, you know, we just need to be fair. We need to buy things right from people. We need to sell things, sell, uh, instruments at an honest price, but I also feel at the same time that probably margins on a lot of things are growing a little bit and they're probably better maybe than they have over the last few years, potentially. Are you seeing that? Mm, I'm not. No, oh, no. Okay. Uh, Explain that. Well, the Prior to pandemic, the online competi competition drove prices down. So, for example, my mother used to collect uh, Hummels. And Hummels used to have radical high prices because there were ones that were hard to find. What are but those? Once, they're like little figurines. Oh, okay. So, when eBay came around, you could put the rarest ones on eBay. And now the person that wants to complete their collection with that one they only made seven of. And it has the mm -hmm. original German markings on it, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Now you can buy it on eBay. And so what happened is they become the rarity became less. Okay. So they weren't as it wasn't as uh, prices all came down. So her Hummel collection when she passed away was worth nothing near what she paid for it. Okay. But she used to carry a book in her trunk and she would hit punch. She was hilarious. She carried a wad of cash and a book in her trunk. And she, one time I was with her and she's like, I got to check something. She opens her trunk. She says, all right, I knew it was that mark. It's such and such mark, which means this is the designer that did it this year in the German factory. And she goes in and pays cash. And this is worth so much more, you know? Man, like mother, but like son, huh? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Uh, Chief Kate, yeah. Um, but, uh, but so that has kind of driven down the prices. It's been the great um, um, levels. Uh, it leveled the field. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of driven prices down. And then on the new side, the margins are shrinking because the costs are going up on every, oh, every well, invoice we get in. That's the right. Cost is up. Yeah. And I mean, so, shipping, shipping companies are, are, are literally just, just, it's just, it's a, I, I would say it's close to a disaster. I mean, the cost of shipping right. just to do business right now in the United States is, is everybody's going to have to make a decision about what's going to happen. So, right. uh, because, um, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but I can see right. that now that you're pointing that out, I can see why margins on new stuff would shrink. I just, I didn't know if the demand, you know, the if supply chains are down and the demand is up, if it would also help, you know, raise prices, but we you, could potentially, I mean, so I'm pushing the envelope a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when I'm, when I'm personally doing buys, if there's something that I, sold for 179 six months ago mm -hmm. i might push it to 199 but i'm okay. also giving the person that's selling to us a little bit more yeah so my margin might be creeping up a little bit but the the big picture is that um we can't get enough hmm. and i'm a little nervous to price push the retails too high yeah um because there still is a national presence so whatever my price is online they can sit and google shopping and see what uh Guitar Center used to sell on them for and what three individuals on Reverb are selling them for. And I've got to be right in that range unless there's significant original packaging and, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Condition issues. Yeah. But it, it hasn't, I haven't been able to uh, capitalize on that a great deal. Okay. Well, it, it just, it's just interesting. I just thought it would be a good conversation to at least think about it because, you know, things sure. are sh shifting and moving co uh, consistently. And in fact, I'm curious to what you think is going to happen to the music industry as we go forward and finish this year into next year. I mean, we have manufacturers talking about if you place an order, you know, if you're selling new, if you place an order now, you can maybe get it by second quarter next year, you right. know. Does this help you? Does this hurt you? How does this affect you? And what do you see the future like? Uh, or how do you think it's going to go? Long term, it's going to help us a lot. Because um, all these people that have money and their hobbies, they're trying out um, music as a hobby. A lot of them, are, it's not going to be their thing. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have stuff to sell in three years. And then with the manufacturers, really, I think they're going to, 
they're going to pack their warehouses. I'm sure they went in and said, we're going to have this captive demand for another year or two. Yeah. Let's make as much as we possibly can. So I think it's going to flood the market with new stuff. So in five years, I think there's going to be plenty of inventory for us to buy used yeah. and resell. Um, in the short run, I think it's it's the whoever's got it's going to get the sale. Um, whoever has the most guitars wins. <laughs> yeah, for sale. Right. Or instruments. Yeah, for sale. Right. Hey, and take a second. I, I meant to do this earlier, and I apologize, but give give a quick rundown just for people who are listening to this. The the, the basic premise of music around. So okay. Well, our our catchphrase is we buy, sell, and trade used in new musical instruments and equipment. Um, we pretty much do everything but pianos. I I like to say if you can put it in your car. And bring it to us. We'll probably buy it from you. I can get a piano in my car. Well, <laughs> then we would probably turn you away. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> not everybody drives a box truck daily. Yeah, right? that's right. That's exactly okay. right. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but we uh, one of the things that I'm challenged with is my staff is they're they're sometimes walking things that are fixable because they think it's too far gone, mm. and so um, that employee we had. I, I heard him out of the back of my ear. Oh, we can't buy this. It doesn't work. It was just a Ibanez Strat copy, right? So I went back with some steel wool, spun it around in the output jack, plugged it in. Ring. Yeah. It works. Yeah. I'm like, let's buy this, mm. you know? And, and I wasn't hiding from the customer. I said, you can go ahead and buy this, right. you know? And then later on we had the discussion, you know, right now we desperately need stuff, even amplifiers that don't turn on, mm -hmm. give them $5 for it because, we'll pay our repair tech to fix it Yeah, because we need something on the floor Yeah, and guitars, unless the headstock snapped off or something, I mean, electronic repairs, we can either fix them or on an acoustic, just take them out and sell it as an acoustic. Hey, here's it. Well, and that's, you bring up an interesting thing as, as well within the, uh, you know, within the music industry. Um, is it important to have techs that can just repair just about everything? I, I'm, and the reason why I'm even bringing that up is, is I'm astounded at the amount of people that, that are in this industry that say they can't do basic, basic things. And that was one of the premises of why we had some of the trainings that we did with MIRC. We did the repair workshops where, Hey, come in. This is another uh, stream of income that you can be able to repair because there's a huge need for that out there. Does the music go around focus on hiring employees that can fix just about everything? Um, I don't know about the other stores. Mm -hmm. I'm very focused on having people that I can farm things out to. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a certain level of repairs that the staff's expected to do. Um, and it's funny you bring that up because in our last store meeting, I had to reiterate that because when we were closed for COVID mm -hmm. and then we were running a scream skeleton crew, um, a lot of those things fell to the wayside. But if something comes in with people are always twisting the wires off the output jack on guitars, they just tighten it from the outside, yeah. twist the wire off and then it doesn't work. Yeah. Or they rip the knobs trying to get more volume <laughs> and they twist the short the wires out on the pots or whatever, you this know, those are simple 11. repairs. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. If I keep twisting it, it will. But yeah. um, those are the kind of things that we should be able to do, mm -hmm. and we do do in-house. Um, replacing a cracked nut on an acoustic or classical or a, even a bass, that's not a hard thing to do. We've got them in stock. We buy them in, in packs of 20 or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, to just re-glue them. I'm trying to re-educate my staff to do that stuff. The, the two smaller stores do that religiously mm -hmm. because they have the time, the bigger, this bigger store it's, I don't have the staff that has, the, we don't have the time. Yeah. They are busy buying and selling and taking care of the people walking in the door. So it's, I've got one guy that's really got his head into it and he loves fixing stuff. Yeah. So he actually, his station, if you will, is the repair bench in the front of the store. He's our set of eyes for shoplifters and, he gets a lot of sales because he's closest to the guitars and yeah. basses, but he's also got a soldering iron out fixing simple stuff that, uh, but I, th I am shocked, especially now with, um, with Google, you can Google, how do I fix this? Yeah. And there's 15 YouTube videos mm -hmm. by people that show you how to solder a wire. Yeah. And it's, I think that, uh, most of the music go rounds get it and know that. 
Um, but some, you're right. Some of the other stores, just the simplest repairs. Yeah. They don't seem to get that it's worth their time to. Yeah. They can buy it for less because it doesn't work, but they're not at the gouge that person, you know. Yeah. You're like, yeah, somebody brings in a, one of the volume pot and you're like, man, those videos are on YouTube, but don't, don't, don't watch those just to sell that here. <laughs> well, we're just, yeah, we'll just, we'll give you 10 bucks less. We can fix it. Or yeah. Battery snaps get always get torn off the of pedals. Yeah. Because they leave the battery in there and it corrodes on there, or they're just not taking the time to pry it off properly. Yeah. That's an easy repair. Yeah. And, you know, we buy those in bags of 25 too, you know, the little bat with the red and black wire. Mm hmm. It's, it's not a problem. Well, and with all of that, and I'm sorry, we jumped over to what is music ground, but, and you were, we jumped back to, you were talking right. about long-term things are going to be good. Now as so. a music ground, as a franchise and what you guys do and specifically your locations, I mean, short term, continue on that, how you guys uh, see things going. I think it's going to go. Okay. Um, actually the two smaller stores business is up. Mm hmm. Is because that real wood you're knocking on, or is that like plywood, or is that? It's uh, wood on a metal desk. Okay, so it, great. That's that why works. it reverberates. It's got some pretty cool reverb. <laughs> um, but because they're loaded with gear, they're um, the one thing I haven't complained about is this Columbus store, the big store. We moved it down the road from 4,800 square foot to 10,000 square feet, mm -hmm. and then we shut down for COVID, and. Now we're reopen, and a lot of the old customers that have been hiding out are going to the old location. Yeah, it's not there anymore, mm -hmm. and they're driving across town to the Gahanna store. So the Gahanna store is loaded to the gills, and the person that took over my storefront even let me put a poster-sized poster in his window mm -hmm. that said "Music Go Round Still Around Down the Road." Mm -hmm. Call us because I have a lot of customers that are older that that don't know how to use a QR code, and they just need to be told straight up with a simple sign, but they're still not seeing it. I think yeah. they're pulling into the shopping center, seeing there's no music go around yeah. and then just going across town because they know it's there. Yeah. So I actually yesterday hired a company to do 11,000 postcards to my customers over 50 years old. <laughs> that says we moved um, yeah. to try to get them because the yellow pages aren't there anymore. I mean, they, if they go to the yellow pages, they're going to find the wrong address because uh... it's five years old. That's this. I just, I find the humor in that, but I realize it's also something that you have to it's do a challenge Yeah, because you know, this store now, when we first moved here, our first six months, we were up 15% and I was afraid we were going to lose business, mm -hmm. but we have a Walmart, a half price books and a pet land. Okay. How can you get anything that would bring parents or family and a movie theater? Yeah. Families and parents are coming to this center all the time mm -hmm. and new people are finding us. But the reality is the older people are losing us. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out how to, how to spider web out to them and, and reach them. Yeah. Well, so, you know, it's interesting. You said that, you know, Gahanna is doing well. The smaller stores are doing well because you packed to the gills because you guys are buying whatever you possibly can. That's I think I texted you at least one picture of an empty wall. And no, said, you did. Please I, help me. Yeah, and I said, oh, I, I was like, holy crap. Okay, let me let me let me figure this out. I wasn't kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you absolutely weren't. But um, but that's the that's the idea that I want to drive home to a lot of our listeners is is it's not you're not. If you have eight empty hooks on your wall, you're not buying eight guitars. You're buying 16 guitars. You buy what you can when you can. Yeah. You have to because you don't know when it's going to dry up. And you don't know when it's like when we went into the pandemic and the shutdown, we weren't expecting to be shut down, yeah. but we were pretty well stocked. Mm -hmm. um, but then three or four months of selling, shipping everything out of the state city, mm -hmm. you know, put us back in a deficit situation. But yeah, I always, if I get too much gear, which has happened, I'll call another music around and say, Hey dude, bring a van. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I'm not kidding. And Doug in Louisville is another one of your customers. Yep. I used to do that with him. Yeah. He was on fire when he first opened. I would drive <laughs> down there and walk through his store. He's like, why don't you come on down and get some stuff? Buy, you know you buy from is. him. Yeah. Yeah. And I go down there and he's got five Yamaha DX7s and four Yam uh, Boss DR550 drum machines. And I'm like, can I have some of those? <laughs> sure. Take a couple. Because he had five of them. Yeah, sure. He couldn't even display them. They're stacked against the wall, let alone all the guitars and the little amps and stuff. We would pack my pickup from bottom to the top of the cab yeah. and the cab 
<laughs> and I write him a check for two grand and come back to my store. And the guys are like, yay, we got stuff to sell. Yeah, uh-huh. And he's just down there like, it'll all sell, you know, <laughs> or I'll trade it for a copy machine, whatever. <laughs> Man, that's very cool. I, I, I just, you know, I realize that there's, there's thousands of stories that could probably come out of you of, of incorporating this exact concept. Well, Doug, um, you know, Doug, and you know, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. when I would go down there, he's like, I don't let anything go out the front door. If they walk in with it, I buy it. Yeah. I don't care if I buy a milk crate full of symbols and two of them are cracked. I throw those two away and I bought the crate and I sell the ones that are there because you don't walk anything. Yeah. <laughs> and I it. came back to Columbus and he was right. Yeah. And your word gets out, Hey, they buy everything. Mm-hmm. And it took me five or six years of doing that to finally realize maybe we should stop buying 70 year old cracked clarinets, you know, and, and, and we started doing that and improve things. Yeah. But in the beginning, I wanted the people to know we're the ones you sell to. Yeah. Well, but and it creates, and I feel like it, I feel like too, that that's going to create confidence, even from a business sense and who you are, that you, again, if you're buying those opportunities and you're consistently buying, you have to figure out a way to turn all of this. I mean, Correct. it isn't all, you just throw it up on the wall and somebody comes in and buys it. You have to sell this. And as you, as you sharpening, sharpen these skills over the years, it creates, it allows you to become better at what you do, which in turn creates growth, more opportunity, and, and uh, having three stores gives me a dispersion place, if you yeah, will, that's, in-house. That's right. I mean, if I get overloaded, I can, um, you know, I can call the Indianapolis guy or the Toledo guy where they're still trying to build their inventory. If, yeah. if we're overloaded, if I make a phone call, they'll come down in two days. Yeah, that's right. Paul over in Indianapolis and Gary up yep. in Toledo. Those are great right. guys. And Mike in Ann Arbor before I took it over. Yeah. That's right. You know, we would swap stuff. Sometimes he would call me, uh, although Mike was real picky. He only bought the best stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things we started like, buying see, everything when I, I went up there. I see what you're doing here. <laughs> yeah. But he, he would be like, so if you got any trombones that don't have any dents and look perfect? <laughs> <He'd> go, well, <laughs> no, I got lots of trombones though. Uh, okay, I'll talk to you later. You know. Yeah. Well, and it's All that's right. actually no different than on our side as we are MIRC, we uh, sell quality refurbished instruments All and right. It's very easy because a lot of times we sell guitars that you're going, man, there's nothing wrong with this guitar. But sometimes there's guitars that go, yeah, there's the repair. The repair's been done well, but you can see the repair. It's right. no difference. It's but it's a it's a skill to figure out how to be able to sell the the perfectly clean one and the one with the repair because they are both equally good instruments. Have so, I ever said no to you when you said this one's got a pretty, this telly's got a pretty ugly chunk out of the front, but we fixed it and it, it's smooth, but you can see it had a chunk no, out of the no, front. No, you, you've never said, you haven't said no too often. In fact, I'm trying to yeah. think of the last time you even said no about something. And, you know, I'm sure it was, uh, I, if you I, ask if I wanted mustard on my sandwich last year at the barbecue. Yeah. And you said, I no. said no. Yeah, you yeah. said no. So, but you're going to be down here for the open house uh, this year, which we're very excited right. for. Man, we're going to have a food truck. We're going to be doing um, that deal on the 13th and 14th of July. So we're excited. There's other music grounds that I think there's five or six music grounds that are going to be here for the open house this year. Cool. So uh, we're very excited about that because we we value that partnership that uh, that you guys bring. So, but um, man, Kevin, you have been you've been you've been great, man. We love you uh, uh, tons and tons. But man, what else what else that you would want to cover in this that or talk about that maybe we missed? Um, I don't think we missed anything. I think we got. Uh, I just my strategy, and I stole it from Doug. Like. The tired of looking at it sale mm-hmm. I talked to you about. Yeah. The guy on the East Coast that did that. Yeah. He, he's not open anymore, but that's what he did. He didn't call it that, but he, I, I just get ideas from other people and run with them. Yeah. And some, some of them work, some of them don't, but you got to try. Yeah. You can't stay stagnant. I'm not the most tech savvy guy. You know, when we were trying to set this up today, I was struggling a little bit, but <laughs> it was great. <laughs> you have to accept that. Yeah. The website sells stuff. And you have to have good pictures, you have to have good descriptions, and you have to have the shipping right or fair or reasonable yeah. or you're not going to be in business. Yeah. So 
that's an aspect of something we didn't even touch on is, is yeah. how you handle shipping on things. But I would think that most, uh, a lot of your business though, is still just people walking in, in your, in your, space. it is. And fortunately because of the internet or the connect collection of taxes in different vicinity, like mm-hmm. the free shipping take is that used to be taken for granted three years ago. It can't be taken for granted anymore. Not all retailers are doing it. Yeah. Even if you do the Google search in shopping, you'll see price, total price with shipping and tax so that you know what the final bottom line is going to cost you. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're struggling to, we're still trying to fine tune that. Um, it's up to us to decide what we can and cannot ship. We really don't want to ship tube amps because they end up getting crushed and yeah. then everybody loses. Um, don't ship big speaker cabinets, but there's some things that are in the middle there that will work with a customer. People call us wanting to bite, want us to ship drums. Drums don't survive. Yeah. <laughs> they get cracked. <laughs> yeah. Those shells, uh, uh, those shells like to snap in shipping. And there's no matter how well you pack them. You there. I, yeah, it's, it's hard. That's a struggle, yeah. but I think it's fix It's figuring itself out. Yeah. You know, you just have to be open to change. You, you don't necessarily have to embrace change, but I think what's kept a lot of people from reaching their full potential is not accepting that change is there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, no, you got to deal with it. You're ab- you're a hundred percent correct in that. So, and, and you do see, well, you're it, in the pros of it. We you've see it all new, the time. Well, you've got a new owner Yeah, and you guys are changing things and things were good before. I mean, I liked working with you guys before I like working with you now but you're streamlining things on your end to make it better for both of us. That's right. Which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah, we'll move into the future together. So, but man, Kevin, man, we like I said, we, we really appreciate you a ton, man. Um, I want to keep having, uh, you know, some different, uh, more conversations as we go through the future, just as things are changing, you know, I'd just like to keep up and have this continue this conversation. So, but I enjoy listening to your, your podcast. Yeah, man, I appreciate that a ton. So, um, man, Ian and I... Can I add I, this to my resume? Oh, yeah, absolutely. A professional actor and... Uh, <laughs> professional actor. <laughs> I've been on the music actor. retail show. So, yes. <laughs> anyways. All right, Kevin. Well, man, have a wonderful day. We'll catch up Thanks. real soon. Look forward to seeing you at the uh, open house in July for NAM Week. And, uh, man, Thanks take care of me. yourself and keep at it. Okay, will do. The Music Retail Show is brought to you by MIRC LLC, providing solutions for the musical instrument community by being a reliable source for diverse music products. If you need inventory for your music store, pawn shop, or e-commerce site, go to MIRCweb.com to find out more.